Hi everyone, my name is Clark Bryan and I'm the Executive and Artistic Director of The Aeolian. And today I have a very special guest. This is Darren Sigsmund and he's the coordinator of the El Sistema Aeolian program. Welcome Darren. Thank you. So today I just wanted to, uh, Brian's out of town by the way, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but uh, I wanted to spend some time just uh, peeling away a little bit at the El Sistema program and uh, uh, getting to know, for you to get to know Darren a little bit. Um, Darren has an amazing pedigree, uh, doctorate in music and uh, trombone player. So he's the jazz guy, my husband's a jazz guy, they're different. Just saying, they're different, um, and from classical. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, we are so um, blessed to have him as a member of the team. Um, Darren, do you want to just tell me a little bit about your musical experience? Uh, well, I uh, I started playing um, piano in uh, sort of I think grade four, grade five, and. Uh, and I started trombone in seventh grade, and I really got into that. And um, and uh, I, I got into jazz at that time, and I found out a couple years uh, about that time that if you really wanted to learn to play jazz, you had to learn how to play piano as well. So I got back into piano more seriously, learned some jazz piano, and uh, it all comes back to the piano. It does. Kind of, yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> Um, and I was involved in a lot of uh, uh, a lot of school bands and orchestras, and went to music camp, and uh, and uh, eventually uh, actually stopped music for a while. I went into the sciences and then political science in university, and I came back to music and studied uh, undergrad and masters and doctorate. But in between the undergrad and masters, I was. I was trying to make it as a musician, as a composer, and I toured around the world with my a couple of my bands. And uh, it was uh, as an independent artist, as you know, it, it was it was it's easy, right? It's very easy. <laughs> yeah, it's very easy. Uh, I did they every just throw money. Oh at yeah. You. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Several years of trying to get grants and failed, and just I kept on working at it, and uh, eventually got some funding. But I invested a lot into into my bands and and. Uh, um, and uh, 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 had some amazing experiences on the road and, and, and really began to understand what it was like to be a jazz musician and how, how you develop um, artistically and also personally. Uh, I learned some, some of my, my uh, the, um, best experiences of learning music was just being on the road in a van and having my band talk about music, about different players. I, I learned so much from that and listening to different recordings as we were as we were driving and uh, and just being able to play for audiences around the world it was just an amazing experience it was very hard hard work and uh yeah, because but, you did a lot of the arranging and stuff well too, it was all, they're all my com compositions you know as the uh, band leader i ch i felt like composition was very much a part of my musical persona and so uh not only playing performing but playing my music was important to me and so be able to do that with the band with some amazing players uh, yeah, you worked with Eliana Cuevas yes right? yes Eliana was in my band strands and we toured for many years together and she was amazing you know she doesn't read music yet she learned this very intricate music that I wrote by ear just just amazing uh, but all the all the other musicians you know you could I could write whatever uh, I wanted to, and they would help mold the music as we rehearsed and workshop the music. And but being on the road and playing the same music night after night, I, I began to understand how some of the, uh, in a limited way, how some of the uh, the classic bands from the fifties or sixties became so good because they were playing music night after night after night. Um, and I'm sure as a classic musician too, you, you you can't just play the same piece of music once or twice. You have to get into it over and over and over again. Because you get deeper. I tried you, not to, <laughs> because I get bored. Well, <laughs> there's that. Yeah. But I, yeah, no, I know I've toured seasons with programs for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that that was a part of very much a part of my so uh, experience as a performer, as a composer, and uh, and yeah. So, um, uh, but the reality of being a performer, you know, it's it's uh, financially very challenging and. Uh, Teaching uh, became a part of what I did, and doing workshops as I toured also, 
Um, so education for me became important. Uh, being able to, even though I didn't feel it when I did workshops that I had anything to give to people, I felt like, you know what, there must be something. I, there, I only know what I know, so I can try to pass on what my experience is on to, to other stu two students. And, uh, and so coming to Aeolian, uh, being part of an organization, even though it was, it's classical based, it, it's music. And for me, music is music, you know, uh, and, and having my wife, Angela Park, who was a classical pianist as, uh, as well as you, um, you know, being able to hear We're good her. influences. Oh, oh, very good influences. <laughs> <laughs> we oh, keep but, you out of trouble. Oh, yes. <laughs> but seeing her play with, with other amazing musicians, just uh, whether it's jazz or classical or anything, you see when they're performing, and I'm in the audience, and seeing how they sort of dig into the music and the passion that they put into it, that it, that it, is, it is music. You have to invest in what you do. And that's part of what we try to teach, I think, at El Sistema with, with the students is that you can't just learn something for two minutes. You, and, and that intensity of our program of three days a week for the regular program, that's, that's very much ingrained in what we're trying to be teaching. You have to invest yourself. You can't just sit back for five minutes and then it's done. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, it's not that instant gratification stuff exactly. that they're so used to, right? Well, exactly. Um, it's... Yeah. Um, Builds character to have yeah. to wait for an outcome. Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, what was it like on the road for you? Well, I was the driver, so it was tiring. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, you know, compared to say classical experience, from what I gather is that for us, we would fly into a gig the day of. Uh, we would, we would go to the hotel quickly, or we'd have to go to the venue, do a quick sound check. Sound checks for us weren't like a dress rehearsal where you would do the whole, the whole concert. You know, for us, a sound check would be as fast as possible, get some basic sounds, and then go to the hotel, uh, rest, find dinner, and then go to the gig. You know, so for us, to, you know, that, that was basically what it was, and then and do the gig. Uh, interact with the audience after the show and then uh, go back to the hotel, wake up early the next day for the next flight or drive. And so it was, you know, night after night like that often. It wasn't have two or three days off. We, it was just... Oh, so I did a few cross-country tours mm -hmm. where it was a plane every day. So I okay, know exactly you what you're talking okay. about. And, and, you know, being a soloist, right? It's very existential yes. because you... You do all that socialization after the concert and then you go back to your hotel room and you're wired, mm -hmm. right? You can't sleep. So you turn the television on and you start flipping around mm -hmm. or you know, get into a bag of chips mm -hmm. or something. And it, yeah, you don't sleep very well and then yeah. there's the next day. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. uh, touring is exhausting. Um, my biggest tour to Australia and Asia, we had about 18 flights in uh, 30 days. Oh it was it was oh crazy, <laughs> and we always had to go back through Hong Kong because that was the hu the hub uh, through through the yeah, the past that I've we had. That. So, yeah, it, yeah. so it, yeah, it was exhausting, but it was amazing. But by week four, we were we were done. Yeah, right. right. Four weeks of touring, it was, it's a lot. Yeah. So, so you married a classical person. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I married a jazz person. <laughs> there you go. There so we have a lot be, in common. <laughs> yes, there must be some. Yeah, there's a bit of uh, what? What do they have that we don't have in our mm -hmm. in our genre? Right? So I think maybe our listeners would be kind of interested to know what is it like uh, in a household where you've got like two musicians with careers and you have a son too, mm -hmm. right? Well, um, one thing I, for me that I've learned from Angela is just how incredibly de dedicated she is and even after having a child well when you have a child um, and talking to other musicians who have had kids you just you can barely practice and you have to kind of change your mindset that I can't practice six seven hours a day like maybe I used to or or even in three or four hours or if you do you have to uh, totally you go through your day uh, your, your child goes to sleep, and then that's when your work starts. So yeah. you get to stand up, stay up to, to uh, one, two, three in the morning to get your work done. It's exhausting, you know. Mm -hmm. But you do have to change your mindset that you can't practice like you used to, and somehow get to the gig, and 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 be okay with how you play. I think that's that's one of the big things that I've tried to impart to her is that you know, there's there's I think in classical training as in jazz, you want to be the best you can be every concert. 
but that's just you ha you're human you know you can only do so much but you also have to remember for me what's more important or most important is not to be perfect but to be musical and that you're there to share with people and that I know from from seeing Angela perform so much and seeing so many people be moved by how she plays that's really what what it comes to you know mm -hmm. you're giving to others from from yourself mm -hmm. you know so uh, your household is uh, not like a totally regular routine kind of oriented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know that feeling really well. <laughs> you know, I interviewed um, one of my teachers, Cecile Lucet, uh, one summer, and uh, she uh, never felt ready for her gigs. She had a photographic memory and could class all technique, but, uh, you know, it was a different concerto every night with a different program she could do that sort of thing and then EMI would come along and say you're recording this right and I'm, I'm not ready well you're recording this you know this kind of thing yeah. but what happened in her case was her um, father and her, her mother-in-law was a jazz pianist and she was out every single night and so her husband said we're not having children I'm not putting my any child you know through this mm -hmm. and she had huge regrets about not having that child mm -hmm. I you know I, I we have children in the green room here at Aeolian Hall all the time mm -hmm. right because yeah. because people bring them on the road I think it's I think it's really possible and it can be done in an amazing way for that child um, but um, yeah I well good luck with all of that <laughs> <laughs> and I think and I've seen it actually with with the group she's she's to travel with that it's uh, it's often harder for women uh, having to them because oftentimes they I've seen in cases of, you know whether she's taking uh, Alfie on the road and trying to find a babysitter on a, on a, on a week long tour and managing that and and uh, you know it, it's just it's crazy so there there is definitely uh, you know it's it's definitely possible that I think in the case of women as artists touring with with kids. Uh, it's it's really challenging, you know. So there are times when she's gone away, and I've taken care of Alfie when he was younger, and it, it's 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 challenging both ways, you mm -hmm. know. But you need it's you need some support somehow, whether it's babysitting or family coming with you or staying back, you know. It's 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 a challenge. Wow. So let's talk about the, all the kids that you mm -hmm. have in your life. How many kids do you have in your life now? Well, we have around, I think, 117, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, uh, which is amazing. We're, we're at pre-COVID numbers, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly where we were then, but... It's uh, out there, yeah. Yeah, I know back in March um, 2022, we were, during the height of COVID, we were at about 45 kids. Mm -hmm. And 85 by the time I started last October, and then now this this fall we're at about 117. So it's it's great with a waiting list. Yeah, yeah. with a waiting list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, do you want to talk about the kids? Where do they come from? And well, they come from uh, predominantly from uh, Latin American countries, predominantly from Colombia, some from Nicaragua, Honduras. Um, our our own teacher uh, Maria, who, who who grew up in Venezuela, and El Sistema. Um, we have kids from uh, um, Thailand, Brazil, um, Vietnam, uh, um, Iran, Iran. Uh, um, just lots of different places, even more diverse than, than last year, I would say. Uh, Korea, for sure. Mm -hmm. lots, of, lots of Koreans who have uh, come on board lately. Um, and it's amazing thing uh, that, um, you know, it, El Sistema is word of mouth. We don't we don't, we don't advertise it. You know, be on our social media. Well, it is on our website. On our website, stuff, website but yes. you have to kind of know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's amazing that a program like this is it, it flourishes through word of mouth, which mm -hmm. I think is which is great. You know, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the kids. One of the things I first noticed when I started just how. No, there's a there's definitely diversity in terms of um, different different types of personalities for sure, like in any program. But I really noticed a certain level of confidence in in so many of the kids, and really really impressive, you know. And uh, like when they when uh, just as I talk to them, how they announce themselves on stage, they just have they're kind of fearless in a way. They just go and do it. And uh, well, some of them have been doing it for quite a oh, few yeah, years. For sure, so, yeah. They're and you, you know, I think the the programs established a culture for that, so yeah. that you know you see someone else doing it, and you you're like, okay, well, if they can do it, maybe I can do it. For sure. And, and you get 
prepped and coached to do it at first, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's, it's great to see. It's not, and it just being able to present themselves and what they do to people. And that's obviously, as you've talked so much about how what we do is translatable to different, um, different uh, areas of life, you know? And that's basically what we're getting at. You know, it's not, we're not trying to make musicians per se, if they go into music, great, but it's more about the, the, the people that, uh, that are cultivating a sense of, uh, 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 individualism and personality and growth, personal growth, and how that impacts community. Amazing. So, um, Jeff Comer, you know, I think he has his doctorate. You have your doctorate. Uh, you know, I've been a classical pianist, and there, there's a lot of high level musicians teaching in this program. And, mm-hmm. and um, I think it's just so amazing that we can offer you know, that level to the kids that, you know, there is that, that modeling. Um, but, uh, you were talking about the, the goal of the program. Um, like what would you hope for with a child coming out of this program that they could do differently than one who wasn't in the program? Hmm. Well, I I think, uh, one of the things that, uh, I think I hope for, I think we hope for is to, to cultivate a sense of, of, of community and one of those things within that is to have a sense of uh, awareness and empathy and compassion uh, because we need that today so much as we always have but even more today and and uh, you know, having people come out of the program who have that awareness uh, have an awareness of the person next to them of, of a sense of curiosity I think also uh, to not just be confined to what I'm doing, but under, try to understand the person next to you. Um, I think that's vital. You know. It's interesting you said empathy because, um, you know, what I hear is it's it, there's a big lack of empathy right now in the world, uh, and it's creating a lot of the stresses that we see, mm-hmm. right? You, mm-hmm. People can't imagine someone else's walking in someone else's shoes or seeing the world that the way they see it right mm-hmm. it's a, it's a, that's kind of blocked off somehow yeah absolutely. so I, that's a really good point um so the um i guess we talked about a lot of things uh, the kids eat uh, a meal and um you were you worked in that industry mm-hmm. too didn't mm-hmm. you can you yeah. tell me a little bit about that uh well i i ended up um uh, after after I finished my undergrad at McGill, uh, I was uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and I traveled a bit and uh, ended up uh, um, apprenticing at this amazing uh, farm in, near Collingwood called Eigenson, and uh, uh, the, with the chef Michael Statlander and his wife Nobio, who was an amazing chef as well. And from there, I, I uh, what he does is it's all organic. He has his own farm and raise his own animals and vegetables all organically and uses the farmers around him as well. Uh, um, and just, he just like transformed my understanding of food, but also uh, the environment, how we relate to food, how we relate to land and how important that is. Um, and uh, so I ended up cooking professionally, uh, part-time and full-time at different points for about 18 years, so. Wow. Yeah. So um, hopefully we'll see a little bit of an evolution of our food program yeah, at yeah. some point i you know i really hope the kids um, develop that appreciation of where their food comes from and you know maybe they can help out in the kitchen eventually and i think that'd be great uh, we have had a few do it over the years but um i would really love to see that program grow uh, not just because you know the the meal and all of that sort of thing um but it's because they don't Generally, a lot of families don't even sit down to a normal dinner anymore. It's mm-hmm. always like in the car, or, yeah, <laughs> or quickly by yourself on yeah. the way to another set of lessons, or on the way to Alstostema. I see them eating before they come in, right? Yeah, or uh, a soccer yeah. practice or something like that. But um, yeah, well, listen, I we could talk forever, but I just really want to thank you for for this time. Um, I hope. Um, our listeners can really appreciate how uh, fortunate we are to have Darren in this community and to be uh, coordinating the El Sistema Aeolian program. Thank you very much, Darren.